welcome all of our guests today and I uh, wanted to uh, uh, introduce uh, my friend Diego Calderon. Um, if you've not run into or don't know of Diego before now, you're in for a treat. This guy's kind of a superstar uh, in his home country of Colombia, but also, I mean, well known across the entire community uh, globally. So uh, really thank you for taking some time out, Diego. Uh, I know you got a million things always going on um, and it's really cool to, uh, to have you with us today. Um, Diego and I have kicked a lot of dirt um, in the same spots at the same time over the years, but I don't think we really kind of connect and really got to know each other until geez, really probably just last fall, you know, when we were, uh, probably, probably say to, probably said hello once yeah at the birth party no, I mean, like, you know, a we, long time ago but yeah yeah just peace out as we're passing at some of the many yeah. festivals that we attended together bird fair and um you know uh, other events like that but uh yeah we were fortunate enough to uh spend uh two weeks on two consecutive trips to costa rica together <laughs> which was just a great time i mean i'm still i'll never forget the uh the unspotted saw what's going to remain one of my favorite birding moments, I think, you know, that we got to share together, but there were so many more. Um, so good stuff. And, and thank you again for coming up. So, I mean, to begin, um, you know, I know your bio. I know a lot of your story. We're going to discuss a lot of that today, but, uh, um, you know, I'd let the others know, I mean, you were trained as an academic, um, you know, and then you, moved over to the other side, the more, uh, embrace more of the recreational side, it seems. It's pretty similar to my own experience. I was uh, one of these seasonal field research biologists and realized after, you know, seven years of doing that, that I was going to have to stop being in the field if I wanted, you know, a comfortable living wage, you know, I'd become a, <laughs> uh, an administrator for these things rather than be in the field. And it was kind of discouraging. I'm like, what now? You know, so I, I too kind of took a right turn and, and um, started guiding and other things. So um, similar path, but can you fill us in on, on when you began birding and how you began? I mean, how long you've been at this? I know it's been a while. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. It's always, it's always a you know, pleasure to be with you either in the field or virtually. And of course I see we have some, you know, Kawa people here connected, you know, 40, 40 people around listening to us. So thank you very much for attending today. Uh, these these webinars are such a fun thing to to watch and and of course you know I I'm I'm, on, I'm honored to be part of the of the team anyhow we're probably you know going to talk a little piece about it at the end oh yeah we'll letting be, you you know trying to, to bite a little bit of the cookie for one of, yeah teasing you for for the next episode of this thing sure. uh, but yeah basically man I I started you know birding a little late I started when I was twenty when I started my undergrad in biology. So I, I went to Universidad de Antioquia, the local university here, and I happened to meet the bird study group that didn't have a professor, didn't have a teacher. It was all students, all young precocial chaps going, doing research on bluebill curacao, describing chestnut cap, pea, new to science. And then it was, it was a pretty, pretty cool time because I've always said that Colum in Colombia, we are living, still we are living and we are going to keep living the Victorian times of exploration. Yeah. And that, that wasn't any different then because in 2000, when I started birding, I was being the field assistant of Andres Cuervo, that is one of the good ornithologists from Colombia, now, you know, curator of birds of the Universidad Nacional in Bogota. And he was describing style Sapaculo, chestnut cap pija. And a couple of friends and myself, we were the young first semester field assistants. Of these chaps so we we're like going to see birds that were not in the book and that was pretty exciting and you know it was it was and it's been like that forever in colombia for us that is quite a quite a privilege so i started birding in 2000 i basically i actually have to say that i i saw my very first birding trip you know by the city i saw andreas and some other chaps whistling playback to suti and tanager and the bird came right in front of their eyes yeah. responding and I, I saw that conversation going on I said holy shit I want to talk to the birds one day yeah. so that got me to birding in, in in 2000 basically so I would love to start I had started earlier you know like some guys many guys that have family that are birders or you know friends and stuff 
but you know it's been a it's been a it's been a nice run as, as you said i kind of escaped a little bit from the academic world i finished my undergrad in biology in 2007 and decided that you want to keep uh on a on a research lab life even i still read all the papers and i'm you know super thankful and, and i admire a lot my colleagues but I, I wasn't the guy to spend you know ages at the lab realizing how this works or how different this is uh, and then you know it was it was just by pure chance that i had free time i spoke english colombia was getting safer in 2007 when i finished my undergrad that i got some requests to do tours and i didn't even have idea like what what is a tour what is a burden tour and you know 2007 november saw me doing my first birding tour and that's that's been my job since 2007 to nowadays not too shabby not too shabby you know i've been i've been birding quite a lot in the in the number one country of birds in the world you know almost 2000 species tons of new places to go exploring and around so it's a little mixture i still you know i still publish papers and short notes on mm -hmm. you know nesting and new range extensions and some behavioral things so that's still my my academic uh, kind of associate side researcher yeah. life, more romantic, I would say. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's birding business, birding tours that that keep me going on around. Well, you know, I mean, you're a great mentor. Uh, you're great at inspiring, uh, you know, new people to get involved. And I know that's another passion of yours beyond, you know, just uh, the actual physical paying tours with established birders um, as well. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a good segue really to, to talk a little bit about your other newer endeavor. Uh, we can bring that up now <clears throat> talk about the Birder Show and, you know, how that kind of developed in the pandemic as a, you know, what is kind of a, uh, I, I guess, something to, to fill the time when you guys were locked down, right? <laughs> kind of thing, kind of thing. Actually, we, we, we got the idea. Uh, at the at the office, when I say the office is where next, that is the you know production company that we made the birders that one hour documentary, like four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And when when pandemic came, we 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 had some ideas of doing like a you know like a TV show, like a talk show, of birds and birders. And, and pandemic came, so we said, oh, well, let's wait. But we said like, what the hell? Let's do it. You know, let's start virtual. And and it was kind of crazy because everyone was of course starting all sort of virtual things, webinars sure. and, and, you know, tons of live things. But we, we, we try to focus this idea that we wanted to interview people, have, you know, like people that eventually were going to be passing through Colombia, coming in tours, coming in meetings and stuff and having them in the studio. We got them from anywhere in the world just joining us. And we try to vary if you have show, seen the show or if you go on and, and watch it, it's on YouTube, The Birder Show, you're going to see that it's a little bit different format. We try to avoid this more frontal approach of Zoom, that is what we all use for sure. meetings, webinars, and all sorts of meetings. We try to record ourselves on the sides and produce a little bit of a, you know, feeling that we are together with the angles on a, on a, on a real studio with our, you know, guests. Uh, and it's been fun, you know, we, we've got quite amazing people, some bird tour leaders, uh, people doing conservation, uh, book writers and you know musicians uh we got you know a lot of very passionate and interesting men and women that they they breathe think sweat birds you know so yeah. we've we've got that chance of meeting all these people and when pandemic finished we we started to bring the show out to the field that is basically what we wanted to do all the time and that's when when you know one of our good partnerships comes to a life that is with you guys with Kawa uh, and I'm not gonna go on too many details because you're gonna have Chris Bell my, my co-host of the show uh, later and he, he will he will give you more candy about it but yep. we've, we've got the chance of you know going to the field you can you can watch already our, our first Panama episodes in the field some from Colombia actually you know sponsored by by Kawa are gonna be soon uh, published and there are there are the result is, is being super cool. We're all going to love it. So we got the chance to really go and explore an area and offer to people what is birding about. That birding is, is cool, it's fun, it's, it's, it's not glamorous, 
you know, it's it's just it's just going and breathing birds and thinking of birds and, and getting tangled in barbed wire and, and you know getting dirty and getting to trying to see lifers, but also enjoying the most common, easy, you know, bird that is around. And we're trying to to transpire that to the people and showing them, you know, like great places to go birding and great people that do birding, conservation, research, et cetera, et cetera in the most honest, clean way. That is basically what we did with the birders with the documentary a few years ago. It's like, this is a fun road trip. Why, why, why not to, to share it? So, so that's the birder show. The birder show has been, has been super fun. It's been, it's been uh, a good way to know a lot of people. And it's also becoming, you know, and, and all the people here connected, like go and take a look the bird. You, you just posted the link, I think in the chat. The Birder Show on YouTube and on all, all the social media is the same thing. The Birder Show, uh, just you know, without spaces or items or anything, and it's just you know an easy, cool way to to go birding and, and showing the birding school. So, you know, we we also invite people that watches the show to let us know, like, man, you know, we, we live here in in Bolivia and the tourism bureau is interested in promoting you know such and such region of the country and showing not only birds but nature and and some little bit of cultural and social tourism like yeah we can we can we can do that for you guys let's get in touch and we have some deals going on we have some some other yeah. ideas and stuff so i i can only forecast that the bird show is going to keep being entertaining yeah. and cool and you know, well you guys are great you know you know i mean i'm a i'm a big fan um you're you obviously can can carry a conversation uh your co-host chris is phenomenal at that so that's oh, absolutely what i was saying absolutely. our little chat you're gonna have to bait me and keep me moving because i don't have those kind of skills like you guys do but, no i tell you uh, i tell you i'm a little i'm a little freak you know chris is like boom 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 and he's thinking on everything and i'm yeah. like oh yeah yeah Oh, trying to he's, catch up. he's the man he's he's <laughs> yeah. you guys uh, put on a great uh, presentation and like you say it's different than just the standard webinars which are also great and in, in entertaining but you bring it to a new level with production you know uh the highest level production have a good uh, team have a good team what yeah. next is, is they are they are very talented you know yeah. a bunch of, of people working there so I, I did put that on there you can just you know if you're not aware or you haven't seen it you can go check out the birders show uh as spelled there on youtube just you know go on youtube and search for the birder show um and it'll pop right up you get to watch some of the episodes and various um things and speaking of that you mentioned uh your earlier your first um field kind of um remote field i guess experience going to panama i see jim uh from tranquilo yeah. bay jim kimball is on watching today hey jim yeah you know yeah. he's our friend lovely uh, place lovely place friend. lovely family lovely staff yeah. what a place to go birding man yeah no it's phenomenal and you can see more of it, of course um online at the u on the youtube channel um on, for the birder show and of course you go to tranquilo bay's own site to see that uh great I stuff hope, i hope i hope there aren't many panamanians watching this because one of the topics we want to discuss is exploration and adding birds to the colombian list and the last bird that we added to the colombian list is an endemic panama ex endemic that i stole from them so, yeah i was gonna say so, you, sorry you about that. adding adding to the list at the expense <laughs> of your neighbors um and i i don't know i i don't are you really sorry about that, Diego? Are you not at really all. Sorry? Not at all. It's a game. It's a game we've been playing forever, you know, since the yeah. early explorers. And right. I mean, it just gets more and more complicated and fun. Like sure. I remember, I remember several years ago, one of our cool endemics was Choco virio, a bird that we only had in the Western Pacific slope. And then the Ecuadorians got them, and they're Choco, and there's a little chunk of the Choco, and we we're like, mm -hmm. man, that was that was, that was a cool endemic. Like, oh man. <laughs> But then you know we we yeah. went exploring like a local sure. a local guide with with Jürgen Beckers, a good friend from Belgium that has a good reserve down here in Putumayo. They went exploring the Putumayo River and they found Kocha and Shrike. So we stole you know one of their endemics to our country. So it's been it's been that yeah. little game. It's been yeah. that little game, and it's just all based on how uncharted Colombia is. That is just sure. a, such a charm to go you know look at a mountain and say. That ridge, no one has been there. Like, let's let's go and camp there for a week and see and see what's the surprise, you know. So we've been, yeah, we've been playing around a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, due to that same, that's kind of a good segue to, to talk into uh, talk about, you know, um, not just stealing endemics from, you know, one country to the other. You know, find that one bird that sneaks across the border. They don't, they didn't respect the uh, the man made line that we drew, you know, Absolutely. across. But Absolutely. but there's there's a lot of other stuff. Um, you talk about, you know, just this great unexplored sort of um, 
territory, you know, the uncharted territory and the last frontier in a lot of ways um, that Columbia represents. And am I right in thinking that you guys are adding a new species of science on how often? I mean, oh man, if you if you think, I mean, clearly Peru and Colombia, we've been we've been in the last twenty years the highest producers of new species for science. Sure. A sure. lot from Peru comes from exploration of some locals and, and LSU, Louisiana State University researchers doing tons of expeditions and doing a lot of their, you know, PhDs and master projects on there. A lot of fine students, you know, and, and as I said, some, some good Peruvian locals. And in Colombia started to happen a little bit the same, but later uh, without much the influence of external, you know, foreigner people. And I would say that since year 2000, around, you know, uh, one one point five species have been adding have been added to the Colombia list every two three years. So it's not yeah. one per year, you know. But but it's been almost like that. Like year two thousand, when I started, I, I remember you know like chestnut capija, style sapaculo. Then it comes uh, tatamata paculo and and you know some other some other new species. Then you have the splits that we start to sample more and more in our country, and we understand that the bearded helmet crest this crazy hummingbird from the highlands that we share with venezuela is not one species but four and from four Amazing. Amazing. venezuela gets one endemic we get three endemics so we've been we've been really busy about that and you know a couple a couple of the good examples let's see if i can share screen here and it works i'm gonna just let me know you should be yep. watching be on your screen. Star yep. screen now yep and you got this you. is this is this is one of the one of the cool examples of, of new species is this wren that it, we named Antioche wren Triophilus cernai. This is a bird that was found by a friend, like a local colleague, 2010. He was in the lowlands birding with a group of students, and he found this wren. That's that's uh, let's, let's actually probably move to this one, and then we can show the other one. He found a wren that was very different to to whatever he was, you know, expected to see here in, in the left. You have Rufus and white wren, Triotorus rufalbus, that is like you know from Central America and the Northern Caribbean. Then in the center, a little darker, you see Nicephorus wren, that is an Eastern Andes from Colombia endemic, dry forest. And in the right, with extended wing, you have the new species. And he came home a little puzzled, thinking like, what the hell is this? Like, is this is this a Rufus and white wren that wasn't recorded there? Is this a super huge range extension from the Eastern Andes, you know, for the Nicephorus? And then we went birding there next day. We found out this thing was singing a little different. And then a group of researchers assembled. And eventually, in a couple of years, we described the Antioquia wren. And mm. this is a bird that is endemic to the, to the dry forest in Antioquia. And it's a crazy thing because my friend Andres Cuervo, that is part of the team we described this, this species with, Andres says, this is a piña colada new species. It's, wow. it's living in the area, lowland area, where all the Medellin people go for the weekends for you know like vacation holiday swimming pool hot hot lowland elevation place and this bird had been seen by people by birders they just didn't realize that there was cryptic diversity there and this was in a roof of white wren but but an antioquia wren so this is this is a photo of me in 2010 i i didn't realize until i saw it today again you know 12 years ago with with one of the type specimens and this just show you how you know how how colombia is it's such a such a cool thing, you know, such a uh, box of surprises about you know like new species and stuff. I, I let me like switch to this this other one, this next one. This is a this is a beautiful habitat. This is you know like pre-montane forest in the Western Andes. Western the, the Andes in Colombia come in one chain from Ecuador, and then once they come into Colombia, they split in three. We have the Western Andes towards the Pacific, the Central Andes. And the Eastern Andes that actually goes into Venezuela. So our, that's one of our secrets for you know having 2,000 species that the Andes don't have two slopes only, but they don't doesn't have two slopes, but they, they have three six slopes, three ranges. Yeah. Yeah. So in the Western Andes, this is the view from, from, from the mountains from Cali, one hour from Cali, one of the most populated cities, you know, in Colombia, one very well-known birding place. And a few years ago, a researcher, like from one of my good friends, Gustavo, one of his uh, workers. She finds a little species of ant beta, and she realizes that this thing is not in the book, and we eventually start to work on it. And then, voila, I, you know, I'm showing you the next video because this video is already public a few years ago. 
but this species still doesn't have a name. I mean, this is a very, very brand new species of Gralaricula, one of the little antitas. Antitas are these mm -hmm. balls, you know, like eggs with, with legs that inhabit the, the, the neotropical forests. And to find one of these cool, charismatic, cute, charming birds is not, is not an everyday thing. The last Gralaricula that was found was uh, ochre fronted in Peru probably 15 years ago, mm -hmm. like 20 years ago, I don't even Beautiful. remember the date. So this is remarkable. This is one hour from the city. This is just in the outskirts. This is a brand new endemic. And we are, we are describing the thing and, you know, giving it a name. Awesome. And one of the cool things that we did with this thing is that we realized it was in a very tiny area. So birders were not going to be able to go and see it easily. So we, we are describing it. We are doing our scientific thing. You know, we are a team of four people, you know, the original girl that, that found it a couple of professors, good friends, and myself, we are describing the species as a new species for science, giving it a name. But then on the other side, I started thinking like, man, how are we birders going to see this bird? So we started a project with the local administration of Cali, the city that it owns this, this property, to feed these and pita, to feed a couple of individuals so people could go and see it. And this is Bertulfo, the local chap there, the, the ant pita whisperer with the weevils, <laughs> you know, with the weevil larvae, doing yeah. the little call, you know, to, to habituate this bird. And fortunately, after some good work, some, some good time and some good money spent in this property by, you know, several people, these birds are coming to eat every day. So the yeah. place is not open yet and it's nothing in our hands. It's the local Cali administration, the city administration. Sure. But this is, this is a little bit of an example of how crazy the, the, the you know, times of, of the of the birding and the ornithology and research have have changed man you know like nowadays new species are found and you can you can have a little project and the community can eventually one day hopefully soon start to earn some money because birders want to go and see a new species and this is pretty bananas about birding and that's a little the taste of what colombia is you yeah. know like you look at that ridge and you say like mm, no one has been there let's go boom new homing boom new tapaculo like, is it is it just coincidence that uh, you know the birds found in Cali and it never stopped dancing the whole time in your video? Is that, and you know, that's, probably that's... probably there is some evolutionary dancing. You know, <laughs> hips don't lie. I mean, Shakira yeah, wasn't that's... from Cali, so, so probably there is a little bit of conver convergence yeah. there. But yeah. but indeed, and we I don't know if you heard on the video. I don't know if those videos have audio in this presentation, but. Bertulfo, the, the the ranger, was calling her salsita. You know, salsa dancer, like uh, little salsa dancer. <laughs> Perfect. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, that's so, it. Yeah, we have been adding some cool, cool species. You know, new species are are as I said, one one or two every two three years. That is that is pretty cool. And it's not only that; is that we are getting, you know, we're we're stealing some birds from Ecuador, Panama, Peru, and Brazil and Venezuela to our lists. I don't know if you you saw there was a couple uh, things that came through the chat. Um, Jim was poking fun, saying that uh, you lost a Tinamu recently um to to panama but also uh our friend Kristen uh from indiana dunes said she'd asked if if you've already made her 2021 birds of columbia book uh if you've made it uh obsolete yes so there you go Kristen. without even oh yeah if you yeah if you go your your last version it actually it has it has this bird that you know is one that i i was gonna also show you is the is the pirre chlorospingus Mm. I actually made a little post on Facebook, you know, telling the story. And, you know, we, we, we found to them, we went to the Baudo Mountains and we found this thing that is a big bush, you know, uh, they yeah. used to be called bush tanagers. Bush tanagers, yeah. Called mm -hmm. Chlorospingus. And this yeah. thing only lives in Pirre. Yeah, humongous, you know, big monster. Yeah. And, and this, this bird, you know, with some local guides, we actually went exploring this, this amazing mountain, pretty remote. Uh, a thousand meters above sea level, got a maple yeah. eagle in the way, and found us, you know, with with a new bird for the country, and it yeah. was a considered a Panama endemic. But actually, in the books for Chris, it's already as hypothetical in some of the books. If you got the Ajerbe book, it's hypothetical. I think yeah. if you got the Miles McMullen book, it's not included. So that's one of the charms of Colombia is that the books are published and they are outdated the next day, and this yeah. is literal. I remember Fernando Gerbe publishing his first version of Birds of Colombia. Very next day, a new bird was added to the country. <laughs> so 
that's like, that's uh, you know that's Colombia. This is very yeah. solitary. Uh, I found it 200 kilometers south of its normal range in, in this mountain. Nice. Was that uh, was that another stolen endemic then, or no? It Just was it was random. a rare recorded recorded for Colombia, but mm -hmm. we made several range extensions that you mm -hmm. know include like 160 to 200 k's gotcha. to the to the south, and you know one was there you are that's the that's the Pirre Chlorospingus. Yeah, that is a monster. <laughs> wow. It's a cool bird. That's yeah. super cool bird. Oh, this is bad quality, but there it is chewing on some cecropias. Yeah. yeah, I mean. Uh, Facebook, of course, takes video and compresses it, and then it doesn't translate well on Zoom either, but we can still see it. Um, yeah, yeah, there you are. Yeah. There you are. It was a monster. You can imagine my suffering. I don't have a camera. I'm a yeah. digiscoper. You can yeah. imagine my suffering. Like, this thing is new for Colombia. I need evidence. And these fucking close pingos, they jump all over the place. I was like, mm -hmm. man, racing to try to get any evidence yeah. from this bird. Yeah, yeah. So that's been the game. That's been that's been it. a little bit the game, and you know, we 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 got so many examples. I can I can you know like quickly show you here. Look at this map. You know, this is this is basically a fiery tail obil that is a nice hummingbird with a upside you know term bill. It's a Guyanese Amazonian Guyanese uh, kind of white sand poor soils restricted bird. Eastern Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, you know. Uh, Brazil and a little bit of the white sand in this area of, of you know, uh, Ecuador and should be actually in Peru too. I think it's in Peru, but it was not recorded in Colombia until a few years ago. This is actually the the, the Iber reports now, now up to date. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You can see a couple of of these dots already in Colombia, and the very first one was here in Me Too in the in the East White Sand Forest, and this is this is my oh, video wow. of of that day. This is the wow. very yeah, first. Bill. Yeah, look at that yeah. bill. This is the very, very first, you know, fiery tail obil. She's, she's, that's a female. Look at that crazy bill. Yeah. I remember we were having breakfast with, with a group of clients and I was a little slower to come back from the bridge where we see the fiery topaz. And mm -hmm. I put my scope on this little hummingbird just, you know, to check what it was. And I yeah. saw the bill. I had a light, this as a life for like a month before in Guyana, leading a trip. And I was, you can imagine, swearing a lot, calling my clients <laughs> like, stop breakfast you have to come and see this thing this is new for yeah. colombia and yeah you know even doing even doing commercial birding we're still adding birds to the country yeah yeah well you know like you said there, that's the fun part about you know going to these places that are um you know not well covered um anywhere you know and you can still find them even in the even in in areas you know um in the states and things you know that's I, i've always loved doing that you know um but uh, nowhere near like the density of the tropics. So and there is something there is something funny that now you mentioned that you find your vagrants in the states for the country or for a state, and you got this avalanche of people willing to take it and see it, and you know, guaranteeing mm -hmm. that it's going to be in their lists. Twitching mm -hmm. is something that doesn't happen here, man. Like we found this bird, or we found bath throated totally tyrant new for the country, and people don't avalanche to those places because it's not an erratic, you know, vagrant. It's just a bird that has been there forever most yeah. likely, and it's just unexplored. So yeah. people think, oh yeah, next next year when I go bird into me too, I'll try to see it. But it's, mm -hmm. it's a very different way to relate on terms of timing with the birds, you know, as, sure. as you do it in Europe and, and in North America, and we do it here in the tropics with the novelties like this. Well, that's, you know, that brings it to another point um, <clears throat> and, and kind of a tangent maybe, but uh, how many birders are in Colombia? And, and is that Am I right in assuming that that's sort of a burgeoning market that's growing exponentially uh, as Huge. far as the popularity? Huge. I, I, I don't have exact numbers, but yeah. I, I, one, of the, one of the interesting things is that the, the ornithological and birding community were very attached together here. We yeah. grew up very endemically isolated. We didn't have researchers, we didn't have visitors as tourists. So all the, all the things were made domestically, locally. Uh -huh. And eventually, birding back in 1990s and early 2000s was very much linked to the academy. A lot of the ornithological societies and, and you know, people studying birds and doing biology and, and environmental engineering and stuff like that. Then it comes to the time of the, of the digital cameras that people can go and watch birds and, and shoot birds with cameras, even without binoculars. And then it comes to, to push it even, even further, the time of, you know, 
social uh, participative science, you know, uh, birthing. What is all this e-birth craziness, global big days, you know, all these all these events. I was I was hardcore playing Global Big Day 2016, 18, and 19, and I was coordinating and blah blah blah. I don't do it in the last years. I think 2019 we got something around like nine, ten thousand people going birding on Global Big Day, and then if you think that you can multiply that by you know a few numbers to to get your totals, it's a lot of people that is birding here, and birding is birding is pretty open and pretty accessible nowadays. All all the major cities around Colombia will have forests nearby or little preserves or places where people go hiking and they are, are full of endemics. I live in the outskirts of the city and I have red belly grackles and Colombian chichalacas and you know a lot of common and cool birds but also a lot of cool endemics. So yeah. birding has been growing a lot. Birding has been growing a lot and I was just amazed you know a couple of weeks ago man when we were at the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival people is, is getting their cell phone and, and turning on Merlin the audio ID automatical thing and it's showing you the birds. That's not it's not happening here yet. Yeah. But that's that's even more welcoming. And even some of us are a little dinosauric, you know, melancholic about how burden it is. Yeah. The, all these new things, we just have Guilty. to embrace them. <laughs> yeah, there you are. I mean, me too. But we have to be thankful that that brings more people into nature and into Absolutely. burden. I mean, so so Colombia is not it's not the exception. You look at what eBird in particular has done for birding, how it's changed it so dramatically in such a short period of time, you know, just just that. And of course, Merlin, just an extension of that. Yeah, I remember I, you know, I'm I'm old school like you. You can see my by my hair. These are all well earned. You know, I've been at this you a while. Are. Uh -huh. are. I'm chasing yeah. you, man. Yeah, <laughs> I got you still <laughs> happily. But uh, I hope you don't catch up. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> That's a bad sign for me. But uh, um, uh you know, I remember what you're talking about with the Merlin thing. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm old school like you and I'm, you know, I've been guiding forever and I'm pointing out the birds as they're singing. And uh, there was this one woman that meeting on the trail, you know, and she said, yep, Merlin agrees with you. Yep, Merlin agrees. <laughs> so now I, I'm really under the pressure. I'm under the gun because now I got to. Yeah. Yeah, I got a fact yeah. checker behind me, you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I just, fun. I just actually, by the way, saw the comment by Jim on the chat. He's saying that, you know, Panama got one of our tinamus and it actually got one of our ones. It got, Jan Axel went to the Takarkuna Mountains, actually mm -hmm. the, the next, you know, reached to Pire, and he got Baudo one. But Baudo one was fortunately not endemic of Colombia because we share it with Ecuador. So our pride, our proudness is still intact with that bird that Panama got. It wasn't endemic. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Not that you're competitive or anything, but let's clarify, you know. Um, there you are. There you are. It's a fun game. It's a fun game. Let me back, back up a little bit to the, the ant pitta and uh, just a, a kind of a question I haven't rattling around in my head. You were saying that, you know, they're working on getting to a point where this can be accessible and, you know, in a controlled manner. I mean, you know, like the Kirtland's Warblers tours in the U.S. were like that in the beginning, you know, until they expanded. And uh, um, I've seen examples of that very successful examples and you know the one in particular is Hokotoko Ant Pitta in Ecuador um, you know where they bring you up there and they've they've got these you know habituated birds that'll come in and it's a great experience and a great way to educate people and also uh, obviously for the local foundation then to you know get some funding um, so it's Absolutely. great do you have any idea on the timeline when that might be live when people are going to be able to come and see this man you know and it's, have you heard any rumors thanks thanks for the question actually because um, um i got that question every day yeah, on messenger exactly. on facebook everywhere and because sure. you know i'm i'm when the guy that is on the yeah right. there you are on the team that is describing it that is the scientific yeah. team sure. the, the nerds the guys we are describing it but i'm also part of the tourism let's say phase of it but true is that we've done everything already to habituate it, to get mm -hmm. it coming to worms every day, every, every couple of days, actually. Uh, but besides that, nothing is in my hands or anyone in the tourism sure. chain hands. It's sure. the property of the Cali administration. And mm -hmm. it's a little tricky because, you know, it's public. It's taking more time. Pandemic came. Everything was yep. delayed. Sure. And, you know, building a hide and building a couple of trails, something that is like done in a month, uh, is taking them you know, more, more, more than we wanted. Um, 
eventually I don't know when it's going to be. I, 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 you know, two years ago, I, I was telling people, I think it's going to be next year, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. But then yeah. nowadays, how things have been evolve, evolving and again, having in mind that I don't personally or commercially have to do anything with how yeah. that of goes course. quickly. No, I just I, curious if you'd heard a rumor there was big news. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it is what it is. I, to be honest, I, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. It's like, it's almost like 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 juggling with, I don't know, politics. Like what's, what's well, going to sure. happen tomorrow and, and after and there's elections? Gonna be people, there's going to be people that are going to be, you know, uh, on the, in the scientific community probably that don't want it or the conservation community that don't want that to happen. But, I, you know, I, I'm a realist and um, I hate to say it, but, you know, if you can make something tangible, for the masses it's a lot easier oh, a is. lot and easier to to conserve you know and that's you know. why we started the project because you yeah. know if this thing it, even if you're a purist and you think that feeding the birds like setting bananas or a hummingbird feeder or ant mm -hmm. feeding is not mm -hmm. good and you shouldn't be doing that even mm -hmm. if you think like that you can think that okay i'm gonna sacrifice a couple of individuals that are gonna come and be habituated they are mm -hmm. not going to be whatever the reasons people give, like non-natural, sure. blah, 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 artificial sure. feeding. But those two individuals are going to allow that the rest of the population is not played back to death mm -hmm. by birders, because we birders do that. People will want to see this thing, you know, yeah. trespass in, in private property, in public property. And eventually, yeah. you know, it's like a couple of individuals are getting the money for conservation. And it's happened with Angel Paz, with Hokotoko, sure. with, with everyone, yeah. you know, that feeds the yeah. birds. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've always been kind of pragmatic, you know, I mean, it's so hard to do, you know, in a perfect world and, you know, um, to be able to say this is the right thing to do and we're just going to do the right yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, if you can't monetize it somehow, if you can't make it accessible, it makes it a lot harder. And like you say, having having an experience like that where people can come and actually physically experience seeing that bird it becomes yeah. more personal and they're yeah. they're going to be willing to you know to yeah. uh push harder against you know whatever else you know you know let's let's you know uh, what, their, you know what, what development I, what whatever I, else you know yeah yeah and, uh, what i tell uh, what i'm telling to everyone about the, the you know salsita the, the new and beat and calis let's hope that the public thing bureaucratic thing is going to happen soon and if eventually that you know takes more and more time the, the bird is going to be found nearby on a private property and some people is going to start feeding it and probably you have to hike more or whatever or, but it's eventually going to be available yeah eventually going sure. to be available. But, but yeah that that thanks for the question because you know a little bit people think that i'm taking a little bit of, of privilege myself and to be honest since august 2019 that we started the feeding project that is one i myself columbia birding has actually spent money invested money into it like hiding the and Peter Whisper and everything, since August 2019, I haven't taken a single client. I'm playing by the rules, you know, that everyone else should be playing. So let's hope that the thing is going to be available, man. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good bird. It's, it's a good bird. It's good. It's fun. Um, like you say, there's tons of other birds to see still. So you talked about Colombia being the number one um, country. That's That's worldwide still. Yeah, yeah, and we yeah, we are very, very, early. very close. Always, you know, to to Brazil and to Peru. Depending on yeah. taxonomy, sometimes the Brazilians get a little bananas on a split in everything, so they get mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. bigger number. Uh, but yeah, you you can think that around we are around two thousand. It depends on which which god you go and pray to. You know, which is your taxonomy, which is your church. Yeah. But but we are there, and and I think at the rate of discoveries. We're we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it. Yeah, that's good. I, I mean, I I know um, certainly that uh, you know uh, Brazil, Colombia, um, Peru, northern Peru, and even I guess Ecuador uh, would fall into that. I mean, that's some of the highest, obviously, concentrations of biodiversity that's in it, the world it. anywhere. That's it. Um, and and that's what makes it so great to go down there. You get these massive list and it can be really overwhelming you know <laughs> the little the little but, secret is that colombia is on the junction of all those countries that you mentioned you know it's yeah. the corner between central and south america so we 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 are blessed with having all this plethora of different habitats elevation elevations micro habitats and that's that's what makes the secret you know to to have a not too shabby around this 2000 birds yeah uh, one quick question, then I will jump to the next topic, but just personally, you know, again, going back to the birding and growth of birding, um, how is the uh, Columbia Bird Fair doing? I know that's been something that I've threatened to go to 
um, a number of times. You still haven't made it, but uh, you, you have know. to. You have to. It's uh, it's pretty funny because you know it's interesting that the Colombia Bird Fair started a few years ago, and and everyone goes to it in Cali. And it's not only birders. There are like yeah. kids from schools going, and non-birders, and people that started birding, and some people from the academic side, from the tourism side, etc. Uh, and then it just started this crazy kind of massification of bird festivals around the country. Mm. Nowadays, I'm, I'm being honest, I'm not exaggerating. If you want to attend every single festival that we have on the country, you, you can't do it in a single calendar year because there are some that overlap in, mm. in, in which weekend they are done. So bird festivals and bird fairs on every city, on every town, on every little area, yeah. Uh, even even some local communities that they have their own projects they want to do like you know festival de las aves de periha so so i guess the colombian bird fair is, is doing great because it's doing a great job you know it's, yeah. it's massifying this thing and eventually you know it's making birding more accessible more fun of course there are the restrictions of the past years you know yeah, yeah. Uh, virtual real stuff but eventually i guess for next year everything is gonna go back to normal and and again colombia bird fair is held in cali and cali yeah. is absolutely amazing area to go birding in the pacific yeah. in the pacific in the chocó in the cauca valley even in the central and these paramos that are you know being explored so it's it's a great it's a great meeting it's a great meeting and and uh, i can't say the number but we have a plethora an infinite yeah. plethora of birding festivals mm -hmm. with kids doing painting of birds parades yeah. going around town with kids wearing costumes of parrots and stuff is is i mean birding is kind of taking the country yeah yeah, I mean, you, know, everywhere. you look at the work that, that Pro Columbia did, uh, you know, too, yeah. just before the pandemic and everything. I was starting to see them everywhere. Um, it's, it's really good to see. You got a ways to go, though, on the festival thing. I just just completed a list of spring birding festivals in the U.S. and Canada and, and compiled 106 events. 32 were held in the two weekends. You know, those Crazy. first two weekends in May uh, alone, Crazy. you know, so it's just so many places to be, um, not enough time. Let's not dilly dally here. And I, I want to talk about your one of your most uh, interesting adventures in birding. Uh, let's talk about you getting kidnapped. That was <laughs> interesting, actually. Back. Yeah. I mean, that's that's Man, a great story. I, so. I mean, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll leave you. I think I, I can put a, a comment in the in the chat with with a link for a documentary. But basically, to make this long, nice, beautiful story short, 2004, we were trying to do an expedition to the Periha Mountains in between Colombia and Venezuela to look for Periha thistletail and Periha metaltail, a hummingbird and a and a, and a furnary that were lost to science for 20 something, 30 years. You know, since the last exploration so, of that mountain range and. We were doing the scouting trip, you know, before the expedition. I was with a botanist and a local guide. And even the area had been well known for being unsecure in the time with, with gorillas. The area had been clean of gorillas for three, four, even almost five years, I think, by, by then. That was absolutely enough, you know, those days to, to think like, okay, so it's okay to go. We went up and what happened is that the army was fighting gorillas in the south of the Andes, pushing them to the north. So we, we, we had the bad luck to cross paths with these guys. And eventually at the beginning, they thought we were military intelligence, you know, that we were spies or whatever, or paramilitaries. You know, situation in Colombia has been very complicated in terms of groups and, and armed presence, something that has been changing, you know, for good in the last years. But we were basically kept hostage for three months, you know, to 88 days. Tough, of course. But I have to say tougher for the family because uncertainty is what kills you, you know, like my mother and my father and my sister, like, and everyone other here, like not knowing if I was alive, if I was eating or not healthy. I did know all those things there. So certainty gives you a, a little tool, a little superpower when, when you are in this situation. And the other thing, man, we were in one of the most fucking unbelievable habitats in Colombia. It was pretty, <laughs> pretty unexplored. So oh, it was going to force me to stay here. For <laughs> man, I mean, like, it, Did they let you use you your binoculars? <laughs> if you can't change it, just enjoy it, you know? Yeah, right. They, they, they took my beans. They took my, my you know, GPS, camera, everything, yeah. field notebook. Uh, but, but, but anyways, the birds saved me, you know? The birds kept me entertained, alive. The birds allowed me to be, to be having something to do every day, 
I was, I couldn't make my field notes, you know, like I, I, I begged them for my field notebook to be returned back. So I kept my list and everything. And they said, no, you know, you're, you're, you're dangerous. You're, you're writing in code. And I said, yeah, of course, I'm writing in code. Those are scientific names in Latin. That's code, man, you know. And eventually they didn't return my field notebook. So I, I made them on the little cigarette, you know, the, the cigarette box has a paper inside, like a metallic paper that is white inside. And they were giving us cigarettes. I barely smoked two or three during, during the three months, but I took those little papers, like a nail paper, and I was making my lists there, you know, and comments and lifers. And I heard such and such with dates and, and notes on natural history and stuff. So birds, birds really saved me, you know? And, and you can actually, you know, a little bit of advertising here. You can go to YouTube and type the birders and you will see this documentary we made, you know, like four or five years ago, one hour documentary that at the end, talks a little bit about you know my kidnapping and how things have changed in the area but you can also go and, and, and uh, write you know search for bird watching with FARC that is an ad geo documentary that I actually just you know kind of posted here a little a little uh, preview and this is a short 15 minutes documentary it's in Spanish but it has subtitles in English and it's about myself going 15 years ago, going birding back with the guys that kidnapped me after we signed a peace deal, as we see in this little shot, uh, with a the, with the guerrilla FARC. So, you know, all this, all this crazy adventure, you know, it's been, it's, been, it's been beautifully going, you know, in a circular mm -hmm. way, in a circuit. That says he, she's an ex-FARC combatant, uh -huh. from the from the group that kidnapped me 15 years ago <laughs> and now we go birding together yeah. like you know birds do connect people you know they do yeah birds let's face it and birds have been saving me my entire life too uh, and, and i never had anything quite as dramatic as what you went through obviously most of us haven't but uh you know at a lesser level every day you know it's it's my sanity it's my my way of of everything know, uh, yeah everything. i mean just we're supposed to do this, you know, I mean, every what? human is born with that natural curiosity, right? You know, you see little kids, they want to touch, pick up every pill bug they see and poke Jeez. every worm, you know, this is, this is in our DNA. And, uh, yeah. you know, birding is something that just comes very naturally. And it just, you know, I mean, I can't, <clears throat> there's, there's been a lot of stuff written on and um, published on the mental health uh, effects of getting outdoors and you know enjoying the outdoors and you know well, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I I know it's it undeniable I see it and then you know I, I love one of our one of our mutual friends Dale Dale Forbes oh, yeah. he he said he says something beautiful that is like you know we all say normally like birding is not a hobby you know birding is a, a lifestyle and you, once Dale told me like yeah birding is not a lifestyle birding is our lives you know it's mm -hmm. We, we transpire birds, we, we sweat birds, and we are all the time connected. You know, like these orange chimp parakeets are making ruckus outside. I, I'm thinking of them all the yeah. time. I'm yeah. thinking of them, I'm, 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 I'm sampling all the time. Yep. yep. <laughs> it's birding with FARC, F-A-R-C, correct? Yeah, F-A-R-C, that is the extinct guerrilla group who signed the peace deal in 2016. Mm -hmm. Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia. Birding with, bird watching with FARC. It's an ad geo thing. is is yeah. publicly available on YouTube. So do watch, do watch both the birders and and bird watching the, with FARC. They are they have good views. So they are the first things that that will show up when you when you search. Uh, Jim Kimball has said he'd happily go to the Colombian Bird Fair with me. So I've got I've got there someone I've got Jim someone Mage, to go with. That's fantastic. You're you just around the corner. And Jim, promise no javirus in Colombia. So you can you can take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> do watch do watch one of our episodes in Panama with Jim Kimball, the birder show in Panama. We we made a prank on Jim, you know. Javiru was his most wanted, not seen yet, you know, target in his area, in his patch. And we we, you know, we, we made a little prank trying to to get him believe I was watching a Javiru and he 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 got it. He 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 was biting the the hook. <laughs> yeah, fish on. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Sorry, yeah. Jim. Sorry, mate. I'm I'm glad to know that story in advance before I got to spend time with these guys. Uh, you know, uh, in December I kept my back to the wall and checked my <laughs> socks all the time. You know, before you have to. I had to be careful. You, have to. you know, the kind of guys, <laughs> the kind of people we're hanging out with at this point. Uh, dodgy people, dodgy yeah. people, man. <laughs>
Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, so I, yeah, what else we got? I mean, um, seems like we really, I, mean, I think on a, on a lot of the normally, stuff. normally this thing is like one hour, one hour and a half or something. Ish. Like. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Because we, we still, we still, I mean, one of the things that we, we wanted to talk about exploration was probably like the, the ground cuckoos. Mm. You know, oh yeah. yeah. Ghosts Forgot. from, Forgot from the Americas. Cuckoos. Yeah. I remember you did the, uh, the thing on Facebook, uh, doing that sort of informal survey and had like, you know, at least of the people that replied on like 51 people, I think, or 50 oh, yeah. in total that had even seen one of these beasts or admitted to it. Um, and, and what the, the number one, had, you know, in that poll that you posted on your Facebook thread was like, had seen four species, but, uh, every, you know, no one else. And then there were like three or four of you that had three, a handful, you That's know, awesome. maybe 10 that had yeah, 10 yeah. or 15 had seen more than one. I'm a, I'm a one one ground one, on which is which is which is your one. one species i should say i've got two individuals of one species but uh rufus rufus vented i guess rufus vented in yeah yeah in panama uh both panama. um along pipeline road and then again uh up in el valle had another and i've so. been i've been so unlucky in panama i've been several times in el valle mm -hmm. and, and, and pipeline and actually, like any ant swarm in, in, in El Valle de Anton would have like a grand cuckoo, you know, I've, I've mm -hmm. missed them. I've missed them every time. But actually, I went to Twitch, my, my Rufus vented in Costa Rica, you know, the, the 20, 2021st, I think, last year, you know, after the pandemic. Uh, because, you know, that for, for the ones of you that are connected there and then don't, don't know what grand cuckoos are, like there are, there are several species. There are five species, some cryptic diversity that are going to be splits. There are some in Asia. We're not talking about those. Yeah, coral bill, Sumatran, and Javan, I think, or Bovian. There are different genus, but they're in the same cuckoo family. And these things are like roadrunners. You know, there are the neotropical cloud, uh, lowland rainforest, tropical jungle rainforest uh, roadrunners. Uh, but they are super tough to see. They are they are ghosts, and they are they have huge ranges. They have low densities. They, they are not very you know vocal in general. So they are tough to see. And what happens is that they follow army ants. Army ants are these you know uh, amazing phenomena. It's actually one of the most successful prolific predators in the world. Like by biomass, army ants kill you know by far the, the heaviest amount of weight in the in the in the world, and they consume it. And army ants actually. I can, I can actually share my screen again because I have a few examples here and I can show you what an army ant swarm is about. This is, this is actually the army ant swarm where I got a red bill grand cuckoo in Colombia a few years ago. And look at the amount of ants just yeah. swarming over this white sand little trail you know that's with my scope probably you know a few meters away and this was packed with ant birds and with some mannequins and tanagers and a couple of these red bill grand cuckoos and they were there because what happens is that the ants are praying and they flush a ton of spiders scorpions snakes mice other birds etc so the birds are specialized in following this thing to to prey on that when you have a, a, a swarm of army ants what happens is that you have the grand cuckoos like feeding there on a frenzy and they are easy. They become the totally opposite uh, context of what they are. They are ghosts. Mm -hmm. They never show up. So what happened, for example, is, you know, that in, I don't remember now, 2014, 15, we we're on me too on an army and so on. And we got a couple of red bill grand cuckoos, these very army ants that I'm showing you. And this is, this is a red bill grand cuckoo. And I'm actually showing you one of the old, I don't know if this is Buffon or this is Gould. It's probably, yeah. it doesn't say who was, but this is uh, one, of the, one of the early illustrations of red bill cuckoo. I'm showing you all the illustration because there are no photos of this bird. There is one shitty photo recently produced by Rose Gallardi and George Beck in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. impossible to see anything on it, but there is a bird there. And there are some camera trap photos from Peru and that's it. Yeah. What happened is that we were in Me Too. And as you can see, this is the ranch you know, the map of red bill grand cuckoo, you know, like Amazonian sector of Ecuador, Peru, and, and Brazil, and in South Colombia. And there was only one report way long time ago of red bill grand cuckoo in Colombia by one of the local ornithologists. And this, this bird was never seen again. Uh, what is not very rare with grand cuckoos, you know, no one sees them. Yeah. And then we are birding in Me Too with a couple of clients, you know, as you can see, Me Too is the red dot in the map. 
north north of the the ranch, almost 200 kilometers north. And oh. we found this couple of birds. And one of the cool things is that ground cuckoos, as a friend says, they you know they're very similar to spiny rats in the Andes. You can't go and chase them. You can't go and find them. You can't mm. go and and hope to see them. They decide when to be seen. They come and give you a gift like, okay, I am yeah. here, you know. So yeah. it's crazy because this is the these ground cuckoos. No one sees them. They are tough to find. But then when you have army ants and when you have the blessing of the birding gods, you got ground cuckoos just walking around your feet. You know, one hour observation, crazy stuff. So I've been I've been fortunate to see three species of ground cuckoos. That was red bill, and as as you were mentioning, Rufus vented. That is actually one of the easy one, one of mm. the one of the common ones, pretty widespread. Uh, it's it's almost absent in Colombian birding. There is there is like Panama and Costa Rica, Central American reports a lot in mm. Ecuador and Peru and Brazil, and nothing in Colombia. Huh. And it's just very low densities. It's a ghost here. Yeah. So yeah. when this bird that is is in the screen showed up in in Costa Rica, I took a flight on a Friday night, saw the bird there with Juan Diego Vargas on a Saturday morning. This is the bird. When they go find it, I mean, chase it to roosting the previous night. Mm -hmm. So I showed up four in the morning. It was dark. I met Juan Diego personally. They're like, mate, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. And we yeah. went to see this bird waking up. And what happened is that eventually later on the day, we got it chasing the army ants. And, mm -hmm. and that's a little digiscoping video of, of ground cuckoo. This is the same rufous vented species mm -hmm. that you, you, you've you seen. You know, it's the yeah. same subspecies. Yeah. And, you know, it, it gave us crazy encounters there was a, a juvenile there this is the juvenile uh munching on a little snail and we could eventually even even uh track this juvenile to roosting that night so the bird eventually five in the afternoon went up to a little tree and you know started just just you know let me let me open this one in in quick time so you can see the eyes i think i can oh well i can i can do zoom but you can see the bird there just, you know, going, yeah. going for a he's, little snooze. Little so it's these birds are... Happy. Oh, man, these birds are absolutely mythical. As yeah. you said, we, we did that post in Facebook of how many grand cuckoos you've seen. There is a post, it's a post with 400 comments. Everyone is inputted their their data there. And, you know, I just downloaded the table. You, you, you said, you know, I did. This is the one, you know, I, I can send the link of the post later or something. Mm -hmm. uh, or just search Neomorphus in, 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 in Facebook and it will show up. And there, from the five species, there is only, there is only uh, one person that had seen four. That's Guy Kirwan, you know, British chap from the, you know, Neotropical Bird Club and working a lot in Brazil. And then there are four people, myself included, that have seen three species. Then there is like 20 something people that had seen two species and 30 something people that have seen one. But as you pointed out, it's not many people that have seen these, yeah. these neotropical beasts. So they keep, they keep, they keep uh, being, you know, like the, the, that romantic exploration feeling. There's, I know people that has been birding a hell lot in the neotropics and they haven't got the, the good luck of cross, cro crossing paths with, with one yeah. of those things. Our, our, our dear friend, George Armistead on your show, on the Birder Show, you know, it's a classic example. That's a gentleman that uh, is very talented birder. Um, you know, own he's been guiding forever, extremely competent, and and just he he was talking of woes of hearing the bill clack but not having it come out. He just more blessed, more blessed. Yeah, and it's I, it's this kind of weird things that happen for birders. Like you you've never seen, let's say, uh, you know, a, a, a leaf tosser. And then you see your first lift tosser, and next trip you see another one, and next trip you see another one. Like that, that's like magic. And the same happened to me. I've never seen this Rufus vented ground cuckoo. I go to Costa Rica and twitch it, and I fly back to Colombia, go on an expedition to try to look for the Sinu parakeet lost for 70 years in the Western mm -hmm. Andes. And I didn't see it, but I was 10 seconds away from seeing a Rufus vented ground cuckoo that our local guides and, and young researchers saw. So it's kind of crazy. It's one bird that evades you. The nemesis, like all your life, 20 something years of birding, and then you see your first one, and next week you see a second one. Like, what the hell? You almost see a second one. You just I crazy, just, you know? just posted the link uh, of that, um, your Facebook. Oh, thanks. thanks. On that, that's I can also, 
I can also, I mean, if people later have comments or questions and links, yeah. there is the Kawa post that you made for the webinar. You can type them in Facebook and I'll respond there. You know. For sure. Um, yeah, I mean, talking a little bit about Rufus Vented Ground Cuckoo too. I know uh, our couple other kind of sidelines, you talk about getting on a plane and flying from Colombia. Our mutual friend, Luis Glace, was going crazy here in he Florida. Was uh, he was going watching to go those posts and, and he did the same thing. He he booked a yeah. flight from from Miami and and shot down to Costa Rica last minute. He just couldn't take it anymore. It's just this bird was being so uncharacteristically um, regularly seen that he just he said, it's "I got go. some sightings." It's, it's a little yeah. crazy what has been happening. Yeah. You know, suddenly they are showing in Arenal and Poco Sol, mm -hmm. Bosque Eterno de los Niños, like yeah. a few places with regular Rufus yeah. the Grand Cucu. That, that that doesn't happen. No, no, it's it's uh, it's good. Maybe they're expanding a little. Maybe uh, they're such cool critters for more people to be able to see them. You know, um, more birders also in the country. The, yeah. They are they're really neat. I remember um, on my life or two, uh, I was not really. I can't say co-leading because I didn't have that kind of skill. But um, I was with uh, again our, our mutual friend Carlos Betancourt uh, from uh, Panama, and he was guiding us, and I was kind of the host maybe um, of a digiscoping workshop there. And we saw this bird, but honestly, the rest of the group were content and, and most of them had never been to Panama. So we were just as excited about, you know, the, the banana quits and things probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, Carlos was going crazy that this bird still out in the open. And, uh, and so he was, I could tell he was absolutely just torn. And I'm like, you know what, Carlos, you stay here with the bird. We're going to stroll down you know i knew enough of the common birds to uh, <laughs> carry that and let him have a little time with that bird because you know he just was not something he'd ever had you know bird behaving that well out in the open and he just stayed there yeah, that, that are superlative extremes you know they could be yeah. they could be shy and not, not shown or or totally totally obliging like exactly the same has happened twice to me with red wing rufus wing grand cuckoo in guyana uh, i heard it in venezuela a long time ago but never got to see it and in guyana my lifer we tried and tried, and I went back to move the speaker. And when I came back, my group, I was with a sunrise birding group, actually, Gina, Gina Nichols is connected mm -hmm. here. Sure. And all these guys were with this worried face looking at me, and they said, we saw it. It crossed when you went back. So I thought, shit, I'm done. These guys are not going to give me half an hour more to wait for it. Eventually, it came super close, and we got good views. And then a few years later, with another sunrise birding group, we are there, you know, in a line, and it's it called super far. I said, okay, guys, this is a good purchase here, let's wait, make playback. And I made playback, actually I made playback like, woo, because Rufus Wing is, is easy to play back with your own voice. Mm -hmm. And the thing came, jump on a, on a hanging vine, beautiful perch, but I was the very only that had a, a little angle for that. Like the group even no, even no didn't even notice the bird jumping up. It's not yeah. that they saw a motion, but it just came and I was gonna say, guys, when it left, I didn't even say anything, you know, like the bird just gone. came, book, book, gone. I mean, they are, they are, they are the masters of, of yeah. challenging neotropical borders. And it's so amazing that it's, you know, it's not like it's, I mean, they're kind of cryptically colored, but, you know, these are massive birds. These are not oh, yeah, yeah. little they're birds chunky. by any means, they're you know. It, it's kind of crazy that they can, uh, they can hide like that. No, that's fun. Um, I, I'm itching. Now I got to come. Jim, we're going to book this trip. We're going to make this happen. We're going to come see you, Diego, because I, I still, we birded together in Costa Rica. And now I got to come bird with you in your home country. Uh, I got to make that happen. So that's going to be the next cool, thing. I can cool, see that. Cool. I, I also <laughs> see that BR, I don't know who's BR on the chat, is sending greetings from El Salvador, you know, one of the emerging mm -hmm. destinations mm -hmm. for birding. Cool. Good stuff. Well, um, Let's see, are there any questions that I see in Q&A or chat? Q&A is empty. Uh, no open questions, okay. Well, Gina, Gina was asking if the Ovil was the one we saw in our tour together there. And uh -huh. we saw, I saw it before, the first record was with some clients from Canada actually. And then Gina probably, actually the video that I showed today is from, from my second sighting that was with you guys, that female mm -hmm. was with you guys. Mm -hmm. So you got me there, you got me there, Gina. Yeah, Gina's a good friend. Again, we've all actually, a actually, lot of the same dirt. <laughs> I'm pretty excited, it's been a while since Gina, Gina and Steven, and I'm going to Bolivia, I'm guiding Bolivia for them next, 
November in Bolivia is such a fantastic country. Man. Like to be a landlocked country has so many birds, so many good habitats. It's such a cool place. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Yeah. Anyway, um, I guess Diego, that's that's it. Um, Allison Bentley says hi, Diego. Good to there see you. There you are. And Allison <laughs> is gonna go to Bolivia with us. And Allison was from my Canadian birders group that we saw the first time. The the, the oval. Yeah, amazing. Small world. That's I've always said. Birding's a small world. You know. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you good, go good. to go to an, an island know. out in the middle of the Bering Sea. You know, and run into people that you know from all over the country. Um, wow. You know, out of the thirty people that are on the island, you know. Uh, it's, yeah. it's kind of funny how how things work that way but uh we get a lot of <laughs> a lot of mutual friends at any rate um it was really fun catching up with you buddy i uh, look forward to seeing you again sooner rather Absolutely. than later somewhere Absolutely. you're gonna you're gonna be out uh, at the global bird fair no i'm not i'm not no. uh i'm actually i'm actually in july going to ecuador to yeah. give a talk at the reunion equatoriana de ornithologia and, and get to well, do some birding so You'll miss some days. fun birders, but uh, I think you'll see a few more birds probably in Ecuador than you will in the in couple, UK in the middle of summer. A couple more, probably less Guinness, but you know yeah. uh, that's okay. Yeah. I'll survive. And you know, man, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Everyone, everyone, you know, a lot of friends connected. That that's cool. And again, Jeff, I I, I cannot say you know enough thanks because you know like you you guys are are giving us a hand with the birder show and. You know, Kawa is, is making the world of birding in Colombia more inclusive, friendlier, easier, you know, like for everyone. And, and there are going to be nice surprises. We are, we are also doing some good birding, showing you some great areas. But stay tuned because the next episodes of the Birder Show in, in Colombia, sponsored by Kawa, uh, we're going we're gonna to touch your hearts with some special guests, some special you know, guys, young guys, we went birding with, so you're you're gonna love it. And then yeah, you know, Chris yeah, Chris Bell is probably gonna gossip more about it. Oh yeah, in the next yeah. Seminars. When we get we'll get Chris on, and and he can really uh, really spill the beans on the show. You know, that was just sort of, but yeah, get a little taste. That's something to look forward to for those that tuned in, and for those who are gonna catch us online later. We did get a lot of messages from folks saying, "Oh man, I can't make it." You know, is it gonna be recorded somewhere? We we will post uh this up on our youtube channel the um the coa sporting optics um youtube channel um probably sometime next week so nice. with nice. that diego man, safe travels my friend sure. good birding and uh, it's great Absolutely. seeing you again man it was, it was awesome uh being able to you know kick back a, a logger with you too in uh, in indiana in person not too bad. Not too bad. where's where's your next birding adventure man Oof, uh next i guess probably the the global bird fair honestly this kind of a a slow time after the the crazy period of april and may you know and then we get to like catch our breath a little bit um there still are some birds to see to see everyone again on that the context of the bird fair yeah. is going to be the same this time like it's so cool it's going to be interesting to see you know what the the new face of this event looks like yeah. you know well it's not yeah. this event but it kind of is yeah. you know we've got some of the same talent behind it as the uh past british bird watching fair Absolutely. but um yeah it'll be great and i know a lot of folks that are going to be there so i'm really looking yeah it's kind of a shame missing it. you know it's kind of a shame missing it I have to go next we'll miss week. you too i will i will have a beer for you i will have a pint just for you uh, I'll, I'll have a i'll have a pint with you you know uh, for you guys in ecuador with, with rick from and and juan freyle we're gonna be yeah. together so oh, that sounds awesome yeah all right buddy well, well, thanks mate. again Cheers. for giving up some time. Great talking to you. And thanks Ciao. for everyone that stopped in. We'll be having a lot more um, webinars uh, coming up more frequently. Actually, I put out a, a call to all of our uh, various folks that, that we work with and, and friends and got just an overwhelming response. Uh, I know we've been quiet for a while and that's on me. I kind of thought these webinars maybe had run their course, but obviously based on the um, the feedback we'd gotten, um, not at all. You know, if anything, they're more popular than ever. So. We're going to be back at it um, and, and having a lot more frequent webinars as well. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend and see some good birds out there.